We're finally free from the clutches of the evil Big Boner. Now we can return to something resembling normalcy in this fucking game. <laughs> there's normalcy, and then there's normalcy. Eh. We're back to shooting things in a not-so-hot RE4 clone. That's, that's yeah, the best that's... we can expect from this game. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's fairly normal, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Unfortunately, those side-scrolling missions, that one we had last vi uh, video, is not the end of that. Unfortunately, we got two more of those. Thankfully, they're not in this video. Hard to believe that singing she-devil would ever crack a book. I fairly like this environment. I it, it, have it's a got, fun it's got a for nice, us. Uh, yeah, it, it's got like a nice kind of like setup and like core puzzle behind it with the bookshelves. Yeah, I've always had a fondness for library environments in games. Mm -hmm. Oh god, I swear if this is a fucking chess piece setup. No, it's just an introduction of a new enemy type that is. Very annoying, like, in a not-so-good first-impression way, considering this is their introduction. <laughs> yes. The idea is that you have to blow up, like, these stone pylon-looking things, because they are the energy source of these, uh, of these goddamn electric bastards. Yeah, first time I saw this, I was like, is this actually a chess kind of thing that we're doing here? Because that never fails to be annoying in games. Yeah. Instead, no, it's even worse. Yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah, at least it isn't a chess puzzle, but... Or a not chess that boss. Yeah. Only oh yeah, and there one was and one was... more... One more pylon just right there inside the bookcases. Oh yeah, you destroy all of them. Oh wait, oh I forgot, there's also that as well, fuck. <laughs> yeah, you, you destroy them all, and then their electricity bullshit is largely gone. Although they do have that big AoE blast when they die. They're really will... mostly annoying just because of when they have that electric field around them and they can just line of sight zap you. Yeah. Although I will give them points for the Dewey Decimal joke. Mm -hmm. Grudgingly. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. That diva bitch is going to lead us straight to Paula. Why would the hell Oh, no, this is relatively simple. Have you forgotten about those yeah. storybooks we found? Demons love a well spun tale every bit as much as humans. So what is your favorite demon story? Oh, that's easy. The Legend of the Overfiend. Huntress. Wait. <laughs> so yeah, the Unbreakable Huntress is something that Johnson's just gonna, like, tell us snippets of it as we go along. There is actually, like, a storybook. Or actually, am I getting that confused? Because I feel like there's actually, like, technically two more storybooks to go I don't remember through. off the top of my head. But I'm because sure it won't have any importance to the plot anyway. Well, I know, like, the the one storybook in here, I'm... Well, I, actually, I don't know. I just know that, like, the, the boss we're going to be fighting at the end is, like, the last of the Sisters Grimm. Hmm. So that book actually might be related to that. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been so many months since I recorded all this shit. <laughs> yeah. I remember there's one for the dancing woman. Yes, uh, the yes, Opera there Diva. Is. Um, cannot, there is one for the Sisters Grimm in general, isn't there? Yes, there is. Which um, is probably one of, if not my absolute favorite of all of them, just because uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a very grim hilarity to it all. <laughs> um, can't remember if there is one specifically for the Huntress, though. Yeah, I'm sure we'll find out before long. Yeah. Still nothing really special with these you know, with these guys. Yeah, business as usual. Mm-hmm. Well the music just will not stop for some Oh there he is. 
Yeah. So, any reason you're not taking out his armor first? Uh, I think just because I kind of wanted to just show off more of like this particular okay. weapon. Also that. <laughs> the little backhand. I mean, part of it was also like I had already taken off like the armor from his upper body, so it, yeah. and it's like I already have like a predisposed kind of habit of just aiming for headshots and body shots anyway. So it was like, well, that's good enough. Yeah, fair enough. Also, uh, notice the sign on the side there, uh, Dante's Inferno reference. Yep. Yep, as as you would expect, because you know, hell. <laughs> Literary hell. I see what you did there. <laughs> oh yes, this is oh, more about the Huntress. An artist's rendition of the Unbreakable Huntress. Lots of demon hunters have challenged Fleming over the years, and while some of them were legends like you, Garcia, very few of them were women. Well, that makes sense. It takes a lot of grip strength to hold on to a hunter's manly equipment. Don't be sexist, G. The ladies I've known had I was just about to call him out on that in Johnson. <laughs> did it for me as well. This is why he's the best character of the whole game. <laughs> and should get a sequel all to himself and call it Damn Dark Knight and just turn it into an underworld common writer action game. Yeah, wanna step down off the soapbox there, buddy? <laughs> or at least pull out a megaphone, you know, make sure everyone can hear you. <laughs> At least loud enough for Suda to hear it all the way across the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the Unbreakable Huntress turns out to be the best character in the game that isn't Johnson. Yeah. Just because she... she is ridiculously badass. Mm-hmm. Badass enough to have, like, challenged Fleming years and years before we ever decided to do this silly quest. Yeah, before we even knew we existed. Mm-hmm. Ah, crap, she's turned into Iron Man. Yeah. So yeah, she gets to completely circumvent the puzzle that we are about to take part in. <laughs> I bet she'd be fun in the sack if she weren't so keen on eviscerating us. Just saying. She I doesn't just, seem you keen on eviscerating, you're just dancing. Company. You could say that a lot about a lot of people. Yeah. She'd be hot if she wasn't trying to kill me. <laughs> or maybe that's the point. Mm. Aha! Indeed. So yeah, that's the thing that you know it kind of deceives you at first because the arrows they point they tell you about like the direction that these things can go in. But what, uh, but what you don't realize until you actually start shooting one is that they are on rails that don't just go from left to right. You know, you can make them go up and down as well, which is important for uh, for this. So, and also, so if I remember right, they don't stop at like every balcony. Yeah, like that. Yeah, pretty much. It's like. Uh, it's like a better and more interesting version of like those Zelda sliding block puzzles. Yeah, I was gonna say it's like an ice sliding puzzle. Mm-hmm. There's but with uh, a gun. A, yeah, there's an old PS1 game called uh, Alundra, which had one of the most infamous sliding puzzles of any game, uh, any game that I've ever played. Um, oh my god! There was like 16 ice pillars that you had to move around. And the game never gave you any indication as to whether or not you were even close to it. Like, legitimately one of the most irritating puzzles I've ever come across in any game. Oh my um, god. And there was kind of an infamous uh, thing in the UK where a magazine had printed the solution to it, but they printed it wrong. Oh, and several shit. other magazines copied them. So all the all these uh, game guides are like flooded with letters the following month saying, uh, "No, you've done this completely wrong. I have been stuck on this section for at least a month or two. What the fuck?" 
So besides that sliding puzzle, is Alundra actually good? Aside from that, yeah, it's an absolutely brilliant Zelda clone. Um, better than uh, most Zelda games, I would say. Um, but I was never particularly big into Zelda, so take that mm. how you will. Okay. Where was I? Ah, yes. The Huntress had insulted the Lord of the Dead, and now his eyes glowed. Some say from rage, others from passion. You are bolder than the other hunters, he said. But even a woman's pride can be broken. There was a flash of steel and a spray of red as both the Huntress's arms tumbled from her body. She screamed, tears welled up in her eyes. Never had she known such pain. But she would not be deterred and continued walking toward her adversary. With a devilish grin, the Lord of the Dead lopped off the Huntress's legs one at a time. Thwoop! Thwoop! Again, she screamed in pain as her torso flopped onto the floor. She could feel his breath as he hovered over her. I could take you right here and now. <sighs> the fists on her severed arms clenched in resistance. Through her tears, she replied, You might take me. I'll bite your legs off. You will never have me. <laughs> Tis but a scratch. The also, I'm gonna, <laughs> also, I'm going to say... Trigger warning. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the the story of the Unbreakable Huntress is not a nice one. No, it is not. Uh, not a book that we can interact with? No, apparently not. Still got mm. more of this to go through. Of course we do. More, more light shots and all that. Uh, it's like they're not even trying with the enemy placement anymore. No, it's like, oh look, a barrel. <laughs> barrel next to spawn point, you know what to do. Mm -hmm. And what do is get stuck in corner and clawed apparently. And miss. <laughs> yeah, this shotgun in this particular instance decided to really let me down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think for whatever reason the shotgun in this doesn't have much of a spread. It's more like a slug. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, especially with like the current upgrades that we got now. I mean, like yeah. it at least has it at least has solid range, like which is you know one of those things where I feel like you know other video game shotguns con consistently fuck up on. Oh yeah, yeah it's, but, it, it, but it's just like for whatever reason at close range, like. It, I guess for whatever reason they decided well we basically made this a slug gun that does not dissipate three feet in front of you but we also should probably I don't know make the range as narrow as a pin yeah so close to a good video game shotgun but so far away yeah and I still feel like I've mentioned this before but it really would have been much nicer for these weapons overall if you could actually swap between the different levels of upgrades because they do feel like totally different weapons by the end. Or, going back to our favorite subject of Doom, make it so that you can swap out the upgrades. Yeah, but also I was thinking more like... Uh, so the reason I've been kind of like thinking about like other like retro games, especially PS2, and I kind of remember Jack 3, of all things. Mm. And that game, like... I actually liked how it kind of handled, like, it's, like, multiple More weapons, because, like, it introduced them in, like, the second game, and there were basically, like, four types, and that was it. Any upgrades you got were just for, like, stat bonuses and stuff, like, damage and range. Yeah. But I, I remember liking how they basically made it so that they added, they made the upgrades, like, completely different, like, forms that used the same ammo type, and you just, like, would, like, double tap or triple tap a direction on the D-pad just to switch to the one you want. So it's like, oh. you just tap once for, like, you know, the shotgun equivalent, but then you might want to, like, go for, like, the grenade launcher, so you tap that in that same direction two more times. There's another game that was kind of similar to that more recently, like, in the last five or so years. I cannot remember what it is off the top of my head, though. Hmm. Because uh, I never played any of the Jack games on the PS2. Um just wear my thing so um, yeah I have no frame of reference for that it's 
definitely something more recent that was like that, I'm sure. Maybe, yeah. I, I just think, like, like, especially, like, after kind of going and, um, like, thinking about, about that stuff again, like, that, that type of, like, weapon switching, like, made more sense in my mind for, like, what this game could have been, because it is just three, like, weapon types. Yeah. And I kind of do just miss having, like, the regular teether. It just, it just looks much nicer than this monstrosity we currently have. <laughs> Yeah, like the first time I saw it, I was I, th I thought like it looks like it's got like half a dozen dentist drills coming off it, which yeah. if they decided to go you know full horror with that kind of thing, brilliant, you know. But as yeah. it is, it just looks ugly and messy. Mhm. Mm and like those and those kind of like multiple like uh, muzzles make more sense when we get the get the last upgrade like for this uh, for this weapon because mm. if you remember exactly what the function was that it had I think I do yeah um, I kind of stopped playing my, my replay before this roundabout in this section I think um, but I do remember the because like I said the teether was uh, the, the gun that I used for the majority of the game yeah um, and I remember it basically being the workhorse for me for the majority of it. So this guy is giving you so much trouble. Yeah, I I stupidly like forgot that he was armored. Just because yeah. he kinda didn't have like the same look. And by the way, that was also I wanna say off the top of my head, unless I'm completely blanking on a moment back in like the earlier chapters, but I'm pretty sure that was like a new enemy. Where like its main gimmick is that it, like it turns invisible, and yeah. it just kind of warps around. But the yeah, nice well, thing about it is that if you do actually manage to uh, like peg it with uh, you know like with a little sticky shot, mm. it does still uh, stay attached to it even when it turns invisible. Oh, cool. Yeah. Again, kind of contributing to why I, I like the boner the most as like the primary weapon, just because when you get that alternate fire mode, it just kind of opens things up in more interesting ways than the other two weapons upgrades do. Yeah. But we're almost almost up to like full upgrades on that thing. Just got to you know, just got to up the reload speed one more and then we can probably like just dump them into wherever. Because of like health is pretty much like at where we need it to be. Yeah. And like your main weapon and health meter are pretty much your two priorities to to focus on, and then any remaining upgrades is, is fair game. Another painting. What happened to the huntress? Well, so impressed was the Lord of the Dead that he put her back together and made her his queen. Time and again he killed her, just to take pleasure in her proud refusal to be dead. But they say she's never stopped trying to claw her way back to the world of the living, where she knows she truly belongs. Isn't that a great story? Her courage is what inspired me to seek my own freedom. <laughs> she sounds like one hell of a woman. I'm gonna say if you start treating your Paramore like Lego, it's not a good sign. Mm -hmm. Psycho pomp and circumstance. It was her turn. Oh, this is the one. Ah. Uh, Maris Grimm. Yes, I love this. To be done with <laughs> as soon as possible. Bucket in hand, she made her way down to the well by the wheat field. She and her two elder sisters were all beautiful. But on this windy day, Maris outshone them all. She was in love. Whoosh. The wheat bowed a greeting as the breeze caught it. And a good day to you, Maris giggled as her nipples responded to the weather and thoughts of her lover. My word! What is this storybook rated? <coughs> she wound a pail of water to the top of the well, but no sooner had she grabbed the rope than she felt a sharp tug, lost her balance, and went tumbling into the gloom head first. Mother Fudge! Mother Fudge! cried Maris. And Mother, nothing hurts. Later, the sun <laughs> sat lower in the sky as two figures approached what the well. What the fizzy was that? <laughs> She was well, let's visit I could find out. <laughs> collie, ow, ow. Help me, cried Maris from the bottom of the well. But as Corleen grabbed the rope to pull her sister up, 
She too was yanked into the darkness below. Well, that's This is like if death in Final Destination oh, stopped giving any so pretense funny. of having plausible freak accidents and was like, <laughs> fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck this particular family. I don't care if this makes any like physical sense. Boom! 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 Suddenly, a freak bolt of lightning lanced down from the sky and hit poor Ow Ow, causing the pooch to explode in a crimson blossom of slippery Ow Ow giblets. Poor stupid Ow Ow. Yeah. Okay, what does the <laughs> dog do to deserve that? Nothing, it's just... Yeah. <laughs> fuck this dog in particular. <laughs> fuck you, fuck these girls, fuck this dog, fuck your house, fuck this town. all she managed to utter. she slipped on leftovers and fell down, down, down into the wicked well. Plonkety rascal rabbitness. Yeah, this isn't, like, the force of death making, like, things do anything in a plausible, like, physical sense. This is just some invisible prankster just shoving them down the well. ...by their beauty. Though that beauty faded, his gift to them was theirs forever. The power to end lives as abruptly as fate had ended their own. The end. I'm also going to just assume that Fleming probably was behind all that just because he wanted them. He, he seems like the exact type of asshole that would set this all up. You know what? I'm kind of bored. Let's just fuck with this family and see what happens. Oh, cool. New friends. Awesome. And their little dog, too. Ugh. That's how you know he's evil. And anyway, it just so happens I've already been immortalized in prose. Really? What is this book called? Big bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> I am sorry, I asked. Yeah. And after the Killer Seven comic, I would not rate its hope, uh, my hopes high for a good one. Nope. No. No way. Oh man. Well, what is it about? What is it about bleeping out uh, the swear words that makes it inherently funnier? So what is it about bleeping out the swear words that makes it inherently funnier? I don't know. I think part of it might be when it's used sparingly. Yeah. Especially if it's for like, if you've already proven that this thing is like super raunchy to begin with. <laughs> and then you just use the bleeps for like the most benign shit ever. <laughs> Some So like halfway between some things are just too much even for us and... You really didn't want to hear, you know, what he thinks about the the French. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that I actually did like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Garcia is not only slightly illiterate; he is also not really a wordsmith. <laughs> And hey, because we saw that storybook about the Sisters oh Grimm, dear. here's the final the one. Sister Grimm is just a bit angry. We've out I don't know, how did she feel about them to begin with? Maybe we did her favor, you don't know that. Who knows? But yeah, this one is still of the same type where we basically have to wait until darkness overtakes the arena to do any real damage. But this yeah. is obviously like the most complex out of all the Sisters Grim fight and therefore I like it the most. It's at least more interesting. But oddly in terms of, you know, working out what you have to do, it's the most straightforward of the three. Yeah, I'm, I mean that makes sense too because just you already did this shit twice in, in essence. Yeah. Just wish they'd been this forthright about it in the first place. Yeah. Cool design, though. Yeah. I, li I the, do like that. I do like the hanging like pendulum blades. Yeah. The the flying side is gonna remind me of a uh, Devil May Cry boss. Yeah, kind of like the like the like 
something like sin or death scissors or something like that. I mean, yeah. like this. I, I mean, I feel like with this and especially with the sides and I guess this design, I feel like this is channeling way more of death from Castlevania than all the than all the previous sisters. Oh yeah. It's the DS games. Um are usually giant scythe with tiny little Grim Reaper attached. Oh yeah. It's like, wh what part are we supposed to be fighting again? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> but then again, obviously, like, the scythes were obviously, like, the most, like, difficult part of dealing with death in those games. Oh, yeah. Because fucking, like, flying arcs and all that. Yeah, I think it was uh, Order of Ecclesia. Um, I just, there was a couple of strategies just to cheese death and Dracula. Um, oh yeah, because uh, for some reason they were the most difficult uh, fights in the entire series at that point. Mm. And look at that, the her sights can totally kill enemies if you just don't feel like shooting. Friendly fire, awesome. Yeah, I always love when that happens. With not enough games that let have stuff like enemy infighting in it, and that's a shame. Yeah, it's like, it's pretty much Doom's trademark. Yeah, and it's a thing that should be more often. Exactly. Uh, fourth verse, same as the first. Yeah, oh well. But hey, think about it this way, like, after this, after this fight, the only other, like, VIPs we'll have to deal with are are just the like the like the singing opera ballerina chick or whatever the hell, and then of course Fleming. Yeah. Which does remind you that oh yeah, we are technically like I think more than halfway through the game. <laughs> it's, we're, it's we're getting weird, close. It, it kind of feels like this should be leading up to the finale, but no, there's a big chunk left over. Yeah, we've got like three more chapters of Act Four left. Two of which are shitty Gradius ripoffs. Yeah. And then after that is like a whole Act Five, which is like fairly decent because yeah. it it doesn't have any of the gimmicks that we've been subjected to thus far in Act Four. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just weird that this feels like it should be like the next boss is the last one, but. It's Nope, nope, still got a while. Yep, oh well. But then again, I can imagine that if it had just ended here, a lot of people would be like, nope, short game, 3 out of 10, absolutely atrocious. And instead they let it continue, and then it's, nope, this sucks, 3 out of 10. <laughs> no, Overstays no, is welcome. Yeah. 7 out of 10. <laughs> yeah. I, I, for, for whatever reason, I just, like, kept immediately, like, whenever I hear a number less than five, my immediate, like, uh, like, response is to go, like, out of five, because I'm so much, I much prefer the five-point scale for, for rating things than, like, a ten out of ten uh, scale, See, you know. I used to work for a couple of gaming websites. Not going to tell you which ones, because I don't want anyone reading that shit. Um, <laughs> I was younger, that's all I'm going to say. But uh, we were like I didn't like using um, numerical scale numerical scales for whether a game was good or not. You should be able to tell from the review whether or not it was worth dealing with. But I was forced to do um, to, to give it like an actual number, which was difficult when I did one of the WarioWare games because what you get out of it is what you put into it. Oh, it yeah. Was it was D WarioWare DIY. Um, oh, yeah, that game. So it's like, how do you say what number of out of 10 this is good at? Mm-hmm. But hey, look at this. So, uh, do you want to be a dentist? More than anything in my life. <laughs> you want to be... Fuck, I'm forgetting who it was in... Wait, was it Steve Martin? In, like, Little Shop of Horrors, that was, like, with the whole, like, so you want to be a dentist song, or whatever it was? Uh, yes. Yes, Steve Yeah, Martin. that's, yes, thank you. I was able to salvage this fucking joke. <laughs> <laughs> we got there in the end. 7 yeah, out of 10, I, joke of the year by IG. Yeah, I, I, I just, I just, 
for a moment blanked on who the fuck the person was, and I was like, oh yeah, Steve Martin. <laughs> Uh, was it uh, Jack Nicholson who played the dentist in the original, or was he the patient? I forget. I... Hmm. I don't know, I've only ever... I, oh man, I've only ever seen movie once. Let her go, you yeah, I've... I'm coming, got baby. it. Whoa! <laughs> Watch your fucking language! <laughs> Sadie on there! Uh, yeah, I got it a while back, but loaned it to someone, and I have no idea what happened to it, so that's fun. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, our good friend, the sushi lamp. Hey, buddy. So, yeah, um... Normally a boss fight would mean, like, the end of the level, but as it turns out, we've got, like, eight more minutes of this. <laughs> Once again, we've got a ways to go. But hey, that's fine, because that also means we get to show off a bit of the dentist. If, if I actually do remember. I, uh, I still, I'm still kind of also in that mode of like trying to get as much use out of the shotgun, because, you know, shotguns. Yeah. Dentist is probably the, the best weapon in the game, to be fair. Um, it, it takes, like, the... You know, like, it, it takes the previous form he had with, like, the multiple, like, muzzle barrels and makes them, like, lock onto individual enemies. Yeah. Like I said, you never need to use anything else at this point. Well, well you do need to use the upgraded shotgun, but that's mostly for puzzles. Yeah. And I still use, like, the upgraded boner, like, the most just because, you know, like, that sticky shot is really, really good. Yeah. But, as I said, it's, it's going to be the workhorse for the majority of the game from now on. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we get taken on the most circuitous, torturous route possible. Yeah. At least I'm not missing this time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now here's the teether in action, but well, until we like get these get these armor pe pieces off. The teether in action. Yeah, or the dentist. I mean to say. Yeah. <laughs> I swear to God, I'll get these names right. <laughs> but yeah, you see that like kind of crosser. I didn't really like let it go all the way. But when it turns red, that means it locks on and you no longer have to keep your laser sight on the enemy at all times. Just one of the barrels on the dentist will will take aim. And it will lock on to individual body parts for no real reason other than giggles. Yeah, pretty much. This was by Raven. Um, you would be taking full advantage of the ability to chunk individual body parts. Yeah. Love their games. Rip and pee. Good old soldier of fortune. Uh, I was thinking Singularity. Oh, Very yeah. Un Very underrated game. Mm. It does become quite satisfying when you charge up like the like the shotgun shot and use all four shells and it just like barrels through enemies. <laughs> Is it armor piercing? Or uh, enemy piercing at least. I'm pretty sure it's enemy piercing. Not something I ever tried to figure out. Yeah. This at least is like and the shotgun has like one more upgrade it needs to go through and unfortunately it's the kind of upgrade I don't really like and it leads back into why I feel like you should have had the ability to switch between the different upgrades because they feel way too different. Yeah, with the shotgun now, in particular it feels like a, a let down rather than a power up. Yeah, because like where we are right now with the shotgun I would say it is at its actual best. Yeah. Because we've gone from a single shot to being able to hold four shots to four shots that we can hold down the trigger to fire all four at once into just like a giant slug of death. So that guy is determined to jump kick your face in. It's like me when I play games sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. No, I need to do it this one way for the most experience. It'll look cool. <laughs> no, this is how I open all my combos. God damn it. <laughs> uh, ah, damn it. Pure Platinum lost. Restart checkpoint. Ah, uh, fuck. Fine. Back to zero zero in the video. Jesus. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, but we're near the end now. Hey, Christopher. You doing well? I sure hope your girlfriend's more stable than that deranged blonde. Which one? Yeah, there are several. <laughs> Clearly, he doesn't know our girlfriend very well. Clearly. <laughs> and this will be the bar where it's like... <laughs> Where, where, like, Garcia, I would imagine, would just, like, pull out, like, the same... Did I ever tell you the story of how I made my girlfriend super crazy and tried to stab me with a knife? <laughs> my friend, let me tell you what she did with the pruning shears. <laughs> you must be over 18 to, to, uh, understand this tale of daring do and surgery. So we have this routine called the egg whisk and the flying helmet. <laughs> Originally, it was just uh, Stir Friday. <laughs> and then that silence is what everyone else at the party feels whenever Garcia starts talking about his <laughs> friend. Uh, sir, this is an Arby's. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you want mayonnaise or no? Oh, yeah, that horsey sauce. <laughs> I told you I wanted a Baconator. Sir, that's Wendy's. Hey, I'm British. What do I know? No, but that actually would have fit well with, like, Garcia's character if he did not know the difference. <laughs> I don't care. Be Just like, give me like... a Whopper. <laughs> yeah, it's like going to McDonald's for a Whopper. That level of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like... Don't upset the psychotic Mexican with the skull. <laughs> Just give him what he wants. Yeah, it's the skull that is trying to calm everyone down. <laughs> <laughs> no, gee, I told you, you can't have that here. They don't serve it. <laughs> also, a little Ghostbusters reference from Christopher, seeing a little bit of a theme. Yeah, I'm fairly certain the, the, the demon telling you to shush was a Ghostbusters reference. Might be wrong. Oh yeah, in that retrospect, I guess it would be like the little yeah uh, when they go librarian. to the the library at the start. Yeah. Man, fuck that bitch. <laughs> you all know why. Man, this <laughs> section just gets even scared That just gets everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, still a great movie though. Oh yeah, I haven't seen it in years. Need to rectify that at some point. Yeah, same here. Oh, but we're but we're out of that fucking library, and you know what that means. Time to get drunk. Yes. Also, Kuriyami dance. God damn it. We're gonna we're gonna drink and dance. <laughs> In the dark. The chapter today is reminiscence, and it's an appropriate title because we are effectively getting two flashbacks of varying sorts. But as you might recall from last time, uh, we got to the, like, to the, like, deepest basement level wearer of the Union slash Flower Sun and Rain Hotel and discovered that underneath is a luchador doctor who, ha I guess, uh, could technically be a necromancer because he just exists to keep reviving Kaido's ex-girlfriend repeatedly after she kills herself over and over and over. And now she wants Kaido to join in on the fun as well. <laughs> Meanwhile, the doctor's just like, I got to suplex a corpse. Best day ever. Yep. Unfortunately, this isn't a especially good day for Kaido as he just walks right the fuck out. <laughs> Gonna say, do not blame him. Yeah, especially when um, he's already had to deal with one part of this kingdom taking death way, way too lightly. 
and this is like doing it again but from a different more disgusting angle you're just making a mockery of death i'm gone yep so now we get to the first flashback x number of years ago where we actually see kaido and yayoi in Kenjin as well, in high school, because uh, Kenjin apparently was already working at the convenience store even that far back. <laughs> yeah, it's like, here's our main characters! Also, I'm here. Hi! Hi, cat face. <laughs> Continues to offer nothing of any use in the storyline. Other than being a cute boy. Yeah. But yeah, uh, Kaido and Yayoi are, are talking for a bit about like their club activities. Yayoi is part of the Kendo Club, which sounds awesome on paper, but unfortunately their club completely sucks ass and have just been losing every competition for three years straight. Even even with her being on the team and essentially being kind of trained by her family who owns a dojo for most of her life. Our family are already considering expelling her from the family just because she's that bad. Yeah. And like, and she even tries to get Kaido to to join, but it's like, nah, I'm already in the Batman club, but um, fortunately, I kind of don't care that much anymore. It's kind of not as fun. <laughs> and the reason why he's so reluctant to just like switch over is that in his kind of uh, kind of vain, cool sounding like way of approaching things, he says like, if he were to do that, he'd have lost to himself. Yeah, stubbornness, it's only... Once it reaches a certain point, it stops being cool. Yeah, especially when you're late into high school. Yeah, it's like the difference between manly resolve and just refusing to change, and he's approaching that threshold. Yeah, it's it's, it's why I dropped out of the high school orchestra like and, and the sophomore year, because it's like, yeah, I'm not going to gain anything else if I keep doing this for two more years. I'm fucking out. Yeah, if it stops being fun... Stop doing it. There's no obligation. You can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, Yuyoi also has complicated feelings about uh, quitting, but for different re reasons. Not so much like just thinking that he uh, that she would like lose to herself, because Kaido seems to think it's all about like you know like his self. She's more worried about what others would think, especially her family, and that she basically. Compares it to death. Like, I would, if I, I lose, I'll die. I would say in her case, she's actually got a valid reason for not wanting to quit because her family is heavily invested in Kendo. Yeah. But then she goes way too dramatic with it and is like, well, man, so well, much for that. High schoolers, man. Like, they're, they're fucking kids still. Like, they're not even fully <laughs> adults, so they're always going to be, like, that overly dramatic. I don't know what you mean. I was born in my mid-50s. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> so this uh, leads us into Yayoi inviting Kaido to her family's dojo just to train and it's like, you know, if you do this and if you ever get hurt during the training, I'll let you come to my room. And he's like, fuck it, let's go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cuts to the actual moment of uh, leading to you know when she and her uh, she and him got pretty fucked up riding down that hill and the, the way it's contextualized makes it seem somewhat less like Kaido's fault so much as it was Yayoi like just kind of she, she's egging him on yeah like encouraging him just try to be like oh come on let's do the titanic pose as we go down this hill at super fast speeds it'll be great you know I can't resist a pop culture reference. Yeah. Two of them, no less. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's uh. I mean, in some way, it is it is kind of shitty of Kaido that he didn't really, you know, try and like stop her from encouraging such such recklessness. But based on what we already saw when he went to 300, I'm pretty sure this habit was already deep seated in him, like throughout his adolescence. Yeah, you could easily draw a, a straight line from this to him at the start of the, the series uh, without even trying. Yeah, but it's also kind of like she kind of should have known better. <laughs> yeah. Than to like uh, to like encourage this because 
Now she is fucking broken. <laughs> and bits like a bag of Lego. Yep. And it's like... Like the couple of panels following her breaking apart is pretty much like her internal thoughts as she kind of feels herself like slipping out of consciousness. No, see, when and you said you were breaking up with me, this wasn't quite what I meant. Yeah, and the way, the way, like, it's all, like, phrased here kind of makes it seem like this is pretty much, I'm going to assume, the moment in, in which Yayoi, like, ends up at the, uh, like, not at the Union Hotel, probably, just because the kingdom did not exist, but probably just end up, well, unless maybe there's, like, time parallel universe fuckery going on, she probably could have ended up there in, you know, kind of in a similar way where it's like, you know, Kaido at the beginning got put into a coma for like three years because of his stunt. Yeah, just, it's Suda. Move on. Yeah, yeah, it, it does, it's really difficult just because it doesn't really make it clear if, like, she ever got back up again and kind of went on her normal life after that whole incident. Yeah, it's very vague as to whether that killed her um mm -hmm. because she says in the previous chapter that that was where she got that scar on her leg um yeah but they kind of unfit unfit to be a bride as, yeah. as she put it as well which still means something different in my interpretation uh, my understanding of it but whatever um mm -hmm. but they here they kind of make it look like she actually died in that um and that accident so mm. yeah and at least like kind of makes it a bit more clear now why she probably is so excited just to have kaido back just because she she wants to keep reliving that that death and rebirth with him although it does get kind of messed up in retrospect because he's got to be in his mid to late 20s and she would still be what 16 17 at this point Maybe, yeah. If if she is a ghost, or whatever the hell it is she is here. Yeah, but... Oh, well. It's Kaido so wakes up, back in his room. <laughs> Charlie is still there. Uh, appar uh, apparently, Kaido's mom was was still able to bring some food for, for him and Chalia. And also congratulating him on the marriage with Akari, who we have not seen since we first got to this fucking hotel. Mm, she's suspicious. she's still out there. Probably chasing down some random stranger with a shotgun saying, Come back, I want to marry you. <laughs> We're going to have a poly relationship. It'll be great. <laughs> You'll like my husband. He'll be your husband too. <laughs> yes, we're going to have threesomes. You better love it. <laughs> Oh yeah, and when I said like food for Kaido and Chalia, yes, yeah, she know she also knows that Chalia's there because apparently he met her. She looks kind of like Bjork. Which one? Like early Bjork, beating up journalists Bjork. <laughs> Did she beat up Chalia? Would probably explain the face. Hmm. But yeah, um, that'll be something we want to hold on to. The fact that we've got like the first acknowledgement of someone else who actually knows who Kaido's mom is. Because <laughs> it only ever seems to be just for him that he notices like the, the food and like the notes that she leaves. Although that does raise the question of whether or not his mother is real now. Who knows? But anyway, following following that lovely meal, uh Kaido talks with Butchin McFuckface at Ogawa from the front desk. <laughs> Fuck you, you asshole. <laughs> you keep slipping you keep slipping pills in my fucking gimlets. I hate it. Enough. At least put them by the side as an aperitif. Jesus. <laughs> so following this, uh, following all the crazy events that had occurred, um Apparently, Dr. Moonlight, the luchador surgeon, is wanting to meet Kaido, but he's like, No, I don't really feel like this. The past couple nights have been hell. I just want to take it slow. And then, you know, the manager decides to go right into, like, listing all the wonderful attractions that could be had at this hotel to, like, ease your body and soul. But nah, he's like, 
I was thinking just being in my room with a drink. I'm out of sleeping pills. You know, like the kind you, pe you keep putting in my drink, you dick. Yeah, and I guess I guess this kind of upsets Edogawa because he was like, Well, I was going to explain everything to you, but fine. Okay, I'll get you your fucking gimlet. Anything else, your majesty? <laughs> you and your Uno playing buddy? <laughs> yes, That's they go back to playing Uno. Yeah, this, this section is quite nice because it's probably the first time we see the pair of them actually getting along together. Yeah. Like, they, they start treating this place, like, as a good vacation, like, on their own terms, and not on the terms of whatever Edogawa's trying to do to them. Yeah. Which that's... he still tries to pull one over on, as we see. <laughs> but, yeah, this is this is just sort of, like, a pair of buddies hanging out, playing Uno, beating up the manager, you know, fun. Mm -hmm. Also, Kaido really does not like being called a Chunibyo. <laughs> Can't say Do that not I blame say him. this to him. <laughs> Dorky he ass Chuni. He'll stab you with a beer bottle if he gets the chance. <laughs> no, it's an otaku. Fuck you. <laughs> I do it old school, you dick. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Edgar is uh, still talking. He brings up a interesting concept known as Hawaii time, which is like basically his way of kind of explaining the, you know, because it comes from Hawaii and how like it's like kind of a traditionally like favorable vacation spot. The idea of like a really great relaxing place to get away to has a different sense of like time and atmosphere to it that makes it feel like you are completely as far away as possible from your mundane life. Yeah, I, I have heard that um, people that visit Hawaii um, on holiday or whatever, when they come back, they start feeling really depressed because they've been to a place that, you know, everyone's really nice and friendly and cram and poi down your gullet and then you have to go back to the daily grind and, you know, they start getting really, really upset because they're not back there. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's a concept that, like, many things is, like, it presents something really great on the surface, but it de but it definitely has like a negative undertone. Yeah, like, when you kind of pull back to reality. Yeah, there's a really unfortunate aftertaste from when you get back from your holiday. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, Kaido finally gets back at Edogawa completely by being like, "Hey, could you check this gimlet for me? Since you're the one who fucking gave it, have a taste." <laughs> Oh, but how about a spa first? I said, please. <laughs> the donk. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, Jalia brings up a good question that this might be a bad habit of his. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, he just, like, he started doing it when the Smith Syndicate came along. And he was just sort of hoping to maybe keep the collateral damage down to a minimum. But he also suffers from retrograde amnesia. So he just keeps doing it to everyone. Or he's a really sinister fuck and this is just a habit that he got from Slipping Girls Roofies. Or he's a really sinister fuck. I mean, I'm trying to give him an out here, but, you know, since he's done I, the I don't know. We've seen that face. There is <laughs> yeah. nothing innocent about that. The butt chin tells all. Now jump in his skull. Yes. He's on the floor. Do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Kick him in the ribs. He deserves it. Fuck him. <laughs> he deserves it like that fucking kid. <laughs> Fuck that kid. Fucking fourth wall breaking asshole. Anyway, uh, <laughs> back from back from Flower Sun and Rain Rants to uh, <laughs> Kaido and Chalia's excellent vacation. Now that the now that the manager's out, they basically get to fully enjoy everything at their own pace. Because this whole place, you know, doesn't have just have a spa. It's got a private beach, movie theater, even a bowling alley. <laughs> Buddy comedy relaxations with bowling. Yep. Yep. All all good wholesome antics like uh, like bashing a bowling ball on Charlie's head and making him bleed pink blood. 
Yeah, why does he have bacteria in his blood? That makes no sense. Oh, wait. Suda. Oh. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah. Weird, weird nonsensical figment of his imagination. <laughs> yeah. That he can physically affect with bowling balls. Yeah. Huh. But hey, at least the nice thing about this, we get, like, in the present, a very genuine smile out of Kaido. Like, yeah. this definitely shows he's got... He he is legit having fun in a non-Daredevil suicidal way. Yeah. Like I said, this is just two bros hanging out, bowling, beating up people for giggles, having a drink. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah. And then leading into more reminiscing and introspection on Kaido's part because he kind of realizes, you know... On top of all the funny games that he's been doing, he has been reminded, you know, about Yayoi and his mom. And it's stuff that he says that he has forgotten since he was uh, since he was a kid. And this gets uh, Kaido to finally elaborate more on his whole "I'm in a hurry to live" shit that he kept hanging on to, like since the beginning of the story. Hmm. And it turns out he realized that he was missing something, which is something to leave behind before he actually dies, like, as proof that he actually lived. Yeah, he wants to leave some kind of legacy, be it physical or, you know, going to 300. Yeah, and it's the sort of thing where, like, in the middle panel, like, he, he says, I continue to live because I don't want to die, is, like... That is the realest fucking thing, especially from my perspective, just because I've had moments where it's like, you know, I kind of feel like I'm not really, like, accomplishing much, and I feel like, what's the point? But also, mm. I don't really have it in me to go that dark and just die, because that alternative's not fun either. Yeah. So I just kind of, so it's like, kind of, and I assume, like, with a whole lot of everyone else, most everyone in the world, it's like... Yeah, you just continue to live anyway because the alternative really isn't a solution. Yeah. Like, deep down, you know that that's not really the end that you should be looking for. Yeah. The, the I think a lot of people, most people, especially in their, their teenage years and early 20s, have a feeling of, am I living or am I just existing? And oh, yeah. there's various ways that can go. Some great, some not. A lot of people just postpone it until they hit a point where midlife crisis or existential crisis occurs and then shit gets wacky. Yeah, and sometimes you just have a revelation about something that just like gives you a reason to keep pursuing living. In this case, like, it's like for Kaido, it explains why he decided on the spot that he wanted to marry Akari. Hmm. Because he kind of felt like, well, maybe this will actually be the thing that lets me leave my footprint, you know? And it's something that I'm actually living for and not just existing like I always do. Yeah, it kind of feels like he's almost going, well, I've nothing left to lose, so fuck it, let's do that. Yeah. Which has its own issues, but, you know, whatever gets you through the day. Yeah. And then we get to another reminiscence as we get back on, onto the subject of Kaido's mother. And this one's got... It's got some really dark implications right here. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've had our fun. Now back to the... soul-crushing darkness. The possible catalyst for why Kaido has been the way that he is just on a lonely drive with his uh, with his mom in the, in the car. Yeah, she's clearly just, crying for whatever reason. Yeah, asking if he if he would die with her. And clearly he didn't. And that memory just kind of ends there. <laughs> you can yeah. probably guess what may or may not have happened. There's a lot of implications there. Um the fact that it looks like they're driving on a, a cliffside above the city um, in the first page of the flashback. Um, yeah. That 
does not bode well. No, it does not. But, you know, fill in the blanks yourself as to what happened next. Mm hmm. Yeah, so it's like. Presumably, he might have lost his mother, like at a very young age. Yeah. And just needing something to that he can have, like, an extremely close relationship, like someone to marry, is really, like, the ultimate reason why he settled on, on being with Akari. Or it could be that he talked her out of it, and it's just one of those memories that lingers that he keeps coming back to for whatever reason. Who knows? Yeah. But either way, it, it seems clear that they are more or less living as separately as possible and don't really see each other much, even if she is around. Yeah. It kind of puts her making food for him into a whole new context, rather than something that a supportive parent does. Sort of uh, paying penance. Like, I can't yeah. do much, but I can make food for you, and hopefully you don't hate it. Mm-hmm. It's, and at least it's... he doesn't seem to hate it. Yeah. I mean, neither does Chalia, so... I'm sure that's fine. I mean, I, I'd not be surprised if it's like... He probably still likes it no matter what. He just wants his mother to be well. Yeah, it's... The, the, the pair of them are almost playing roles of, like... She wants to make things up to him, and he's... He's letting her feel better, even though he may not feel it. Yeah, by just continuing to be his kind of distant, lonely self. Yeah. And just kind of being an oh. undertaker, like dealing with death in, in other areas. Or it could be that, you know, neither of them really wants to acknowledge what happened, so they're doing their best to sort of step around it and deal with it as best as they can. I said All of these are valid theories that <laughs> may or may not be true by the time you reach the end, which will lead to a whole other set of theories. But for now, uh, af after that little heart-to-heart, Kaido and Charlie head back to the hotel. They're going to get some extra spicy Neapolitan. And it seems like Kaido's just going to keep enjoying his time at the hotel as best he can before, before getting back on the road. For, for yeah. as serious as a job as what he currently has, he does need a break. He does need a vacation. Yeah, he, he definitely seems like he's uh, he, like that, that smile on his face in the, the last page is just sort of like, you know what? The world can wait. Let's just have some fun. Yeah, which is like what I feel everyone needs to have at some point. Yeah, it just that's... Thing where it's like, this can this can legit wait. I need I need some me time. Yeah, your problems will still be there when you wake up. Unfortunately, but in a better way. <laughs> yeah, you'll you will hopefully at least be better equipped to deal with them once you do get back. But I mean that depends. Yeah, 